Thank you for coming. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Baramara Darug people um, and pay my respects to um, traditional elders past, present and future. Um, this is, uh, this, is, this is one of the fun things to do. We're here in Government House and it's like stepping back and past. And I went up to see the Women of Distinction exhibition and I was, what I was expecting to find was, was the Governor's ladies who were there and the domestic servants. And they're not the sort of people I write about. I write about the people in between, about the, the women um, of the town who are earning a living for their families. And so I wasn't expecting to find anything up there that kind of made me think, oh, and resonated, because it's all, you know, women in crinolines who do important things, or it's domestic servants who do very important things, but, um, but there was nothing, no, none of my women. And so I'm walking around the exhibition, and you'll find there's a picture of Mrs. Phillips. And I thought, I know her, because she ran a school. And she ran a school in Parramatta, so she's a businesswoman. Not only that, her sister actually turns up in my book which is really weird because her sister came out with her and her sister was a spinster lady. And rather unusually for a spinster lady, she ran a boarding house. Mm. And um, because normally boarding houses were run by widows or married women, because quite frankly, if you're a single woman mm -hmm. and you're running a boarding house, you might be offering other favors on the side, it might be assumed. You know, you'd have to have very much unimpeachable respectability. Now I have to say that Mrs. Phillips was quite unimpeachable and I think her sister probably was too. But poor Louisa, who was the sister, um, didn't do very well because one of, some of her lodges absconded without paying, which could be a bit of a problem. And then she broke her leg and then she became insolvent and she just she loses everything and disappears from the records until she dies six years later. So she has a really tragic story. And the unusual thing is that she had family in the colony because she had her sister who was running a school, who has a connection to Government House because she's got her portrait in this exhibition. And her sister was a widow and had eight, nine children. She also had a married brother who'd come out as well. But clearly there's something going on in those family dynamics because neither of those other two seem to have stepped in and and helped. Now Louis, the, the Phillips woman, Mrs. Phillips, whose first name I have instantly, Emily, thank you, Emily Phillips, who came out. She came out as a widow. So she didn't come out with her husband. She didn't come out looking for a husband. She came out as a widow with nine children. Now that's not the normal image of an immigrant that we have, is it? We normally think about these boatloads of young women wanting to find husbands or be domestic servants, or we think of um, convicts women, or we think of men coming, to, coming along to be pioneers and dragging their poor little wives behind them and all their children. But this woman came out on her own with her children. She came out as part of a larger family group, but when she was here, she made her own way. She started a school, she started a business. Now that's not our normal image of colonial women. And what I want to think about tonight is how do we remember our colonial past and how, do we, how does that relate to where we are now, particularly in terms of business women and, and are just starting to, to pottle around in the area of 20th century business and I'm realising that it's not you know, a straight line trajectory from the 19th century to now. And there's certainly been some areas where things have gone backwards. And it's quite interesting to think about, about what's gone on there. So, I want you to think about the memorials you know to settlers. Now before I start, I do have to say the one thing, one thing is missing from my book, apart from a couple of women, and that's indigenous women. I found it really hard to identify indigenous women in business in Sydney in the 19th century. I did find a couple, and then a colleague of mine, Paul Irish, has written the most amazing book that looks at Aboriginal people in Sydney, and he has managed to find um, evidence of women as, Aboriginal women as market sellers down there, um, down where the Opera House is now, and other women doing other stuff. I found a, um, a ferry proprietor on the Georges River. So there, there were women around, but they're, they're not, as obvious as, for example, Maori women in New Zealand, who I did manage to find records of them, still fewer than white women. I think the interesting thing about women's history is that when you're trying to look for women in the past, they are hidden. You can't, you can't find them. You know, the records generally talk about, you know, 
Mr. John Brown and Mrs. John Brown, you know, if she's lucky enough to get a mention. And they often don't talk about what she's been doing. If you think about obituaries, I love obituaries. They tell you so many good things about people, except if it's a woman's obituary around about the turn of the 20th century, so around about 1900, they tend to go, so Mrs. Jo Mrs. Caroline Smith or Caroline, the relict or the wife of Mr. John Smith has died and it's terrible. And this is what Mr. John Smith did. And she had all these children and she had all these sons and this is what they did. And then she had daughters and they got married to these men and that's what those men did. And it's often you don't find out anything about the, what the women did themselves. Except, of course, they're often, they're often renowned for being wonderful stalwarts of the church and doing lots of lovely charity work because that was an appropriate, seen as an appropriate thing for women to do. Because, of course, in the 19th century, there's this rhetoric of domesticity. A respectable woman was a nice, kind, gentle, mild woman who stayed at home and, you know, devoted herself to creating a haven of tranquility for her husband, who was out there doing all the important stuff. The reality, I would argue, is somewhat different. But when we think about memorials, I want you to think about memorials to settlers in Sydney. Now, if you think about memorials to settlers in Sydney, you do get a, you do get a lot of memorials to individual men, the politicians, the great and the good. You get um, depictions of settlers, you know, the archetypal settler. And usually it's a bloke. And there's a, there's a wonderful memorial in Ningen that is to the pioneer settlers of Ningen. And it's a man. And it remembers he has a, he has a companion because it's his dog. So it's this man and dog. And that's to the settlers of Ningen. And you're thinking, well, you know, there wouldn't be that many there if, if there hadn't been a few women around. But... We do have, um, we do have set memorials to women, but generally they have one thing in common. They've got a child. You know, it's motherhood. We remember pioneer women as mothers because that was their important role. And it was an important role. I mean, they produced the next generation um, and, and they raised the next generation and, um, and they also cared for all the domestic rubbish and they put up with their men. Sorry, guys, but they did. And sometimes the men were a bit rubbish. Um, and generally speaking, um, a woman was um, secondary. When a woman got married, they had this wonderful thing called coverture. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. You probably are. Um, that um, women, women, once they got married, disappeared as legal citizens. So there's this wonderful quote from some guy, um, a, academic, a legal academic in um, a legal scholar, William Blackstone, and he's supposed to have said that when, when a man and a woman get married, they become one person, and that one person is the husband. So the wife disappears. She can't, she can't own property, pretty much. That all goes to her husband. He controls her property. Um, she can't sue anybody in court. Um, she can't go and make any contracts without his approval. In all of her dealings, she is regarded as her husband's agent. And if she goes to court to chase somebody for a debt, she has to have her husband physically with her. So all of this, you would think, might make running a business quite difficult if you were a married woman. Particularly if your husband, as so many of them did, decided to run off to the goldfields or went off with another woman. But in spite of that, a lot of the women that I actually found running businesses in Sydney were wives. Some of them, and the most successful ones, I have to say, are the ones who, they would run one business and their husband would run another business on the same premises. You know, there was a supportive family environment. Um, you know, when, when you've got a supportive family around you, it really made a huge, a huge difference, which is why the example of Louisa Ong, who was a spinster and yet had this connected um, group of people, family, familial group of people, is such a surprise. So, where do I go from here? Okay, there are no memorials to businesswomen in Australia that I found, except two. And the first one is Mary Reby, who's on our $20 note, of course, and we remember Mary Reby. The second one is, I discovered the other day, in Moree, of all places. I went to Moree to give a talk, and they have a park. And the park, there's a, um, it's, it's a park that is named after the first, this woman, 
of the town, who basically owned half the town. She did have about three husbands while she was doing it, but they were all a bit of a dead loss. And so, but she just had, she ran every business around. She had the local pub, she had this, she had that. And they've got a park and they memorialize her and they remember her as a businesswoman, which is very unusual. Um, because normally, as I say, women are remembered as wives and mothers. And yet, if you go to Sydney in the, 19, in the 1850s and you walked down Pitt Street, you would have been hard pushed to avoid bumping into a businesswoman. Because I reckon that around about 20% of businesses in Sydney had a woman involved. Now she might have been in partnership with her husband, or she might have been on her own, or she might have been in partnership with someone else, but 20% of businesses were run by women. The figure today is around about 35, 35% of small business owners or business owners are female. Now that's not a huge difference when you think about it. But we don't remember, we, when we think about women in the 19th century, we don't think of them as business women. And I wonder why that is. I think we've been sucked in to the rhetoric of domesticity. You know, when you read a book about 19th century, you read about, you see images of the governor's wives. You see images of the domestic servants there are very few images of women in their businesses. When I was trying to find um, illustrations for my book, it was actually quite hard to find a picture of a woman in business, actually standing outside her shop or, or actually doing something that looked like business. There are very few around. Occasionally you find them, but they're not, they're not sort of, the, the mostly you find the women, there's the, um, the wonderful Goldfields collection from Hill End of photographs from the 1870s by Holterman, thank you. And if you look at those, it's quite interesting because the streets of the town are full of men. You can't hardly see a woman. If you have a picture of a house, the women are seated back in the veranda and the men are standing proprietorially outside, or he's standing up, you know, looking like he owns the place, and she's sitting down beside him. It's really quite interesting when you look at it. And this whole image is of this family thing, where, where you've got, you know, women ensconced in their families doing family things, which a lot of them did. But nevertheless, there were businesswomen on the streets who were incredibly visible. Um, and they were doing all sorts of things. I mean, you know, they were publicans and they were brothel keepers and they were um, seamstresses and um, they ran boarding houses but you know I also found um, an undertaker and a plumber and someone who had a ginger beer making business and various other things and a lot of them sometimes they inherited from them from their husbands but it's interesting when you th have to think about that you know we always assume that when a widow inherits a business she's just kind of holding on onto it until the husband's until the son is ready to take over but some of those caretaker widows, they were there an awfully long time in business. I have one wonderful woman in New Zealand who um, her husband was a butcher and he died. And she had two or three strapping sons, but she ran that butcher's for the next 40 years until she died. And you look at, there's a photograph of her and she just, she really look, you can tell she's had a tough life, but boy, is she a tough woman, you know. And, it's, and, and there's a wonderful story of um, that Randall Bedford tells in his memoirs when he was a little boy in the 1860s in, in Sydney and he would go to what he called, now I'm going to get the name wrong, Mrs. Somebody's book, Butcher's Shop, Mrs. McNamara's Butcher's. And he remembered as a little boy going in there and watching her and he said, she handled that meat axe like it was a toy. And she very proudly claimed that she was doing six bodies a week. Now, that's not the sort of image we have of 19th century women. It's a very different version of femininity. But I think for most of the people who came to Sydney, they were working class people. They had always worked for a living and women were expected to work for a living. Um, and yet, and yet we, we've kind of, we've kind of suck, got sucked into that middle class ideal of domesticity. So every time you say a woman's place is traditionally in the home, you've got to think, well, hang on a minute. It certainly wasn't in the 19th century for many women. They were in the home, but they were doing all sorts of other things as well. But we just forget that. Um, 
There was one interesting thing I just found the other day when I was looking at a British historian called Ivy Pinchbeck, and she was writing in the 1930s about women and work. And she had this wonderful phrase that she said, we're talking about a time that was before, and she was talking about the 19th century, um, before we had this modern idea that it was the, an adequate contribution from a woman was in the care of her children and family. In other words, in 19, the 1930s when she's writing, she's saying that it's a lovely modern idea that women should only have to be in the home. They don't have to be outside the home working. So for her, she just was, and I'm thinking, well, okay, nowadays the modern idea is the complete opposite. It's how to get women into the workforce because we want more women in small business and more women in the workforce. And it's quite interesting how we change. So I wonder how that colours the way we think about the past. You know, what we want for now, does that actually make us rethink what's going on and judge differently what's going on in the past? I have to say one of my pet hates today is the way that the um, making childcare available debate is always framed as beneficial for women rather than beneficial for parents. You know, it's, it's, it's creating the idea, it's continuing that idea that women are responsible for childcare. Because those women in the 19th century had inspired, they had the coverture thing where they weren't legal people, legal persons once they were married. But many of the other problems that they faced in business will ring very familiar to many of us. They had the double bind, the double bind of having to look after children where it's automatically assumed that women are responsible for childcare. Um, and even even now, I think it's still there are remnants. I think I think my daughter's generation it's changing. I'm hoping it's changing. Um, but they also had you know um, a lack of access to capital. And when I give talks, I often get the stories about how women in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s tried to go and apply for bank loans and open bank accounts and get mortgages. And if they didn't have a man, no chance. So some of the problems that we have in the 19th century are still with us today, or they've come back again, and I find that quite interesting. So I'm interested in, what I'm interested in is the way that, the way we interpret what we find in the 19th century. My obsession with finding businesswomen in the 19th century, and my, my joy when I find someone who's doing something different like taxidermy or plumbing, is partly related to the fact that now, that would be really cool and it would be a feminist statement, then it was probably just desperation. But I'm interested in how, how, you know, what we're living through and the problems we face actually colour how we remember our past. So I hope you enjoy the exhibition and pay play, play special attention when you see her to Mrs Phillips because she was indeed a businesswoman. Thank you very much. Thank you.